All right, welcome back everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to get started with our session on accessibility and inclusion with the 2022 code with Catherine Wolf and David Galbo, principals of Galbo and Wolf LLC. Folks, take it away. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our session on accessibility and inclusion and code updates for 2022. And also thank you to Katie Spencer and AIADC for sponsoring Design DC. I'm Katie Wolf, Principal of Galbo Wolf Accessibility Consultants and a certified ADA coordinator. Joining me this morning is David Galbo, an architect and principal at our firm. Our intent today is that this presentation will provide you with an awareness of accessibility and inclusion and the impact on design. We will also discuss updates to codes in the DMV region, including changes to the 2017 ANSI and the IBC 2021. And finally, we'll look, we will look at some highlights of ADA enforcement activities and best practices to mitigate risk. Let's begin with awareness of accessibility and inclusion. Accessibility is a requirement to design buildings that are usable by people with disabilities following a prescribed set of standards. Inclusion is a concept to design buildings that are not only accessible, but can be used by everyone regardless of age, gender, and ability. Inclusive design, which embraces universal design concepts, is emerging as clients seek building designs that, that align with their diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. What do we mean by disability? The ADA defines an individual with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental limitation that impact major life activities. Uh, types of disabilities and how they affect individuals range from vision, hard to see objects, lights, color, distance, mobility, use of hands, feet, arms, auditory, difficulty hearing sounds and processing information, neurological, including sensory, mental, and motor skills, cognitive, which impacts memory and attention span, and medical hard to endure certain physical obstacles and maintain mobility. We are in a time, a little ahead of myself. Um, we are in a time when inclusion is not just a word, but a necessity. The CDC estimates there are 61 million adults in the US with a disability. That represents one in four adults. The U.S. Census data states that almost 13% of the overall U.S. population, including children, self-identify as having a disability. Who estimates over 1 billion people have some form of disability? That represents over 15% of the global population. Employment for individuals with disabilities is often an untapped resource. The Labor Department reports during 2021, 72% of people without a disability are employed, while only 31% of those with a disability are employed. And the unemployment rate for those without a disability is only 5% while the rate for those with a disability is twice that high. And now David will continue with the next portion of our presentation. Thanks, Kate. Uh, everyone should be aware that accessibility is required. Uh, it's a required part of the design process for the built environment. What you may not be aware of though, is that accessibility compliance has two distinct parts federal requirements, and state building code requirements. 
compliance with one is not necessarily compliance with the other. So let's briefly review. Federal requirements are part of civil rights laws, not building codes. They contain laws, rules, and regulations that define accessibility compliance beyond architectural standards. As, as examples, excuse me, both federal standards and state codes regulate accessible design of spaces and elements uh, in hotels, in, access, in assembly spaces, in retail facilities. But only the federal regulations include requirements such as hotel reservation policies, event ticket sales, ticket prices, group tickets, uh, access to goods and services, and so forth. Uh, these additional regulations can impact design like the distribution of accessible hotel rooms uh, to meet reservation requirements, accessible seating locations and arenas, and floor space in retail. It's important to know that scoping requirements are in the laws, regulations, and standards, and all three need to be considered for design impact. So sometimes on our desks, we have um, a copy of the ADA standards or was going through a PDF and we think we have the entire uh, document that we need in order to uh, answer our questions. And in fact, we really don't. Um, and the government hasn't done the best job of this, but uh, the, the requirements are spread throughout, as I mentioned, the laws, the regulations and the standards. Um, so it takes some digging to find all of the answers. Uh, state building codes have some spread of requirements as well in that states have regulations which adopt the building codes, like the IBC. And then they may have additional requirements in the regs uh, related to the building code. Then the local municipalities have to adopt the state codes and in some states, they are allowed to add their own amendments. Uh, the technical portion of the code for accessibility uh, is, the, is the ANSI standard. So by adopting the building code, they're then adopting the ANSI standard as well. And there are a few uh, municipalities uh, around the US that have actually uh, developed amendments to the ANSI standards. So while accessibility is a requirement, inclusion is a desired outcome, uh, which includes and extends beyond accessibility. Uh, your, your clients are most likely engaged in diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives to improve their user experience in their business or in their institutions. Clients are beginning to engage architects to not only assist with accessibility compliance, but also with inclu inclusivity enhancements to meet their DEI goals. Making workplaces more inclusive can improve employee retention with employees that have temporary disabilities, uh, chronic illness or cognitive disabilities where workplaces were previously unfriendly. They can also increase hiring, uh, which is so desperately needed now, uh, from the talent pool of employees with disabilities that had pre been previously overlooked. I've had the opportunity to work with clients like Microsoft, Apple, uh, and St. Louis University, just to mention a few, on inclusivity initiatives in their facilities. So we are really seeing client-driven initiatives where the clients are actively engaged in both accessibility and inclusion to meet their objectives. Okay, we're starting off with the Mid-Atlantic updates um, with what's happening in the uh, federal space. Since federal requirements apply equally to, the, to state requirements. 
For those of, of you on the webinar who do healthcare work, the UX Access Board uh, has new standards for medical diagnostic equipment. They are not yet regulations, but for future planning, you should be aware that they include clear floor space uh, at, uh, equipment, um, and this will impact exam and diagnostic room sizes. In addition to transportation inclusion, the board is studying self-service tran transaction machines and inclusive fitness equipment. If they both become uh, future standards, additional clearance uh, space around uh, the equipment will most likely be included. There are no timelines set for um, any of these studies to be turned into standards, uh, but the Access Board uh, is continuing their work. Uh, under Fair Housing, um, HUD has shut down their Fair Housing First website, which provided technical assistance and training on Fair Housing design and construction compliance. Uh, so that resource is no longer available. Uh, for those of you who on the webinar who work in the federal space, President Biden signed an executive order on DEI and accessibility in the federal workforce. It includes a directive in reporting by federal agencies to ensure both federal and leased facilities meet the ABA. It also includes an inclusivity directive to federal agencies to maximize accessibility in the physical, I'm sorry, of the physical environment at the workplace. And I think that's the first time we've seen in history uh, of the federal government to go uh, beyond the standards um, and to use the term uh, inclusion or inclusivity um, to improve the working environment in federal facilities. The current IBC is the 2021 version. And uh, the 2024 version is under development. Uh, DC is using the 2015 IBC with their own modifications. And Maryland and Virginia are both using the 2018 IBC with uh, their uh, amendments and modifications. Both states in DC have started their three-year co-development cycles for the 2021 IBC. Uh, so those are underway now. People are making uh, comments and submitting proposals and uh, they all should be within the end of 2023 and beginning of 2024. Um, they will be producing um, their final uh, codes which will be based on the 2021 IBC. Uh, I'm a member of the technical advisory group for accessibility uh, for DC. And uh, DC is, I can tell you that they're skipping uh, the 2018 version and they're going right to 2021. So they, they fell somewhat behind uh, and uh, they decided that uh, they could make that jump. Other states have done that um, in other years. And this will catch them up uh, with the ICC codes and put them in closer alignment with Maryland and Virginia. And so that would be a good thing for architects in the region. Um, it, you know, if you work across the DMV is to see closer alignment, at least to the, the bulk of the codes um, besides what each uh, jurisdiction uh, amends. So uh, we're starting with DC. Uh, the district amends uh, the IBC and these are uh, just uh, a group of highlights of the more significant amendments. Um, DC increases the number of accessible sleeping rooms for I th group I3 facilities, which are correctional facilities. Um, it also adds section 1108.5, which is the last bullet point 
uh, on this sheet um, to the code that, that doesn't exist in the IBC. Um, it's a section added um, that goes along with uh, the 1107 uh, 55 five at, at the top for the for the additional sleeping rooms and uh, it's really a group of detailed accessibility requirements for correctional facilities and it just covers uh, holding and housing cells medical care facilities and visiting areas um, just more specifically than what is in the IBC. Uh, transient lodging facilities in uh, which are group R1, um, DC deletes the single building calculation method and requires all sleeping units and guest rooms on a site to be counted when using the table in the section. So this has a net effect of a slightly higher number of accessible units uh, than what the IBC had, uh, which uh, and the and the ADA has as well, um, which allows buildings over fifty units to um, be taken separately at the table using the table to determine the number of accessible uh, units. Uh, the biggest jump is really in group R2 for multifamily apartments. DC increases the number of required type A units from IBC's 2% to 15%. So that's a substantial increase. Uh, and uh, they require 1% of the type A units uh, to include a roll-in shower. So 1% of the type A's uh, is uh, usually translates to only uh, one or two uh, in the average size uh, multifamily building. Um, since a higher number of accessible units are required, they must be dispersed, dispersed amongst uh, the classes of units. Uh, and uh, this has been interpreted um, as the number of bedrooms, the size of the apartments, and the amenities. Um, also, uh, some additional items in the type A units are allowed to be adaptable. Um, and uh, they include laundry appliances, uh, refrigerators, freezers, uh, kitchen cabinets and countertops, switches and outlets above, above the countertops as well. Um, the type B units in group R2 are allowed to have adaptable shower doors if they are easily removable without damaging the surrounding finishes. Now note that this is only in uh, type B units, uh, making shower uh, enclosures work in the type A units is very difficult. And uh, there is not an exception um, we have tried uh, code modifications as well with DC um, to get them to uh, use the same exception for type A, and we have uh, not been successful. And we'll go on to the next slide. Um, now on to Maryland. Uh, Maryland deletes IBC chapter 11 completely and replaces it with the Maryland Accessibility Code. Um, this is a, this code is very short uh, and it's essentially um, a list of requirements um, and uh, it requires really all buildings except multifamily projects to use the 2010 ADA standards. Maryland added a few additional requirements. Um, one is that uh, second stories of that are 4,000 square feet or greater uh, in two-story buildings uh, must be accessible. So IBC and uh, the ADA have uh, an elevator exception for uh, two-story uh, buildings. So Maryland has set the bar a little higher saying that anything um, 4,000 square feet or more on the second level um, has to be accessible. Um, 
and Maryland also added uh, one in four parking spaces must be van accessible instead of uh, one in six um, that is in the IDC. The Fair Housing Act guideline is uh, the requirement for multifamily projects in Maryland. And because Maryland de deletes chapter 11, uh, there isn't a requirement for type A units in, in the state. So uh, this makes some clients a little uneasy. And often uh, we have developers uh, that will include voluntary type A units in their projects uh, to accommodate potential uh, tenants, um, especially uh, in this region uh, where uh, people may move from Virginia or DC to Maryland uh, they would may have that expectation that type A units are available to them. Um, they're certainly above uh, the fair, fair housing requirements, but uh, some developers are concerned that they could generate uh, uh, complaints. So they will put type A's in regardless of um, Maryland's um, deletion of chapter 11. Now, Maryland does allow jurisdictions to amend their code. Uh, they can only make it more stringent. Um, they can't make it uh, any less so. And they are allowed to adopt chapter 11 if they, if they desire. Um, all of the, the, the major and most populated counties uh, as, as well as uh, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, uh, Montgomery County and so forth um, have not done that. Um, so uh, there isn't really any type A requirement in any of the major uh, municipalities <clears throat> and counties. Um, now on to Virginia. Um, again, Virginia amends the 2018 IBC with some fairly uh, minor requirements. Uh, Virginia requires more accessible parking spaces than IBC in parking areas with over uh, 125 cars. So in the IBC, 101 to 150 is uh, five. Uh, Virginia split that at 125. And, and so then up to 150, it jumps to six and continues as the parking lots get larger. So it adds, uh, it adds a little bit more parking. Um, additionally, there's a um, chart as well for um, residential occupancies. And uh, again, that is uh, a little bit higher. It's about 4%. Um, it scales a little bit as you, as you go down the chart uh, where the base IBC was, it is only 2% uh, accessible parking spaces for residential occupancies. Uh, Virginia added an additional requirement for multi-user, what they call gender neutral toilet facility fixtures. It's a long, long title. Um, so I refer to them as non-gender restrooms. Uh, these are multi-user, not single occupant. So uh, it's actually one of the earliest states to, to really uh, define uh, non-gender restrooms uh, for multi-users. Um, even though many firms have been doing this and some of the states are relaxing their rules because they haven't yet put it into their standards, uh, Virginia has. Um, and what they've done is essentially taken the requirements of two separate uh, sex restrooms and put those into one. So if you do a, a multi-user um, non-gender restroom, you have to provide two water closets that are accessible and two sinks that are accessible and at least one urinal. Uh, so as I say, they've essentially combined what would be two separate sex restrooms so that an adequate number of accessible fixtures are provided. Um, in these multi-user restrooms, the stalls must have full walls and full doors. And there's uh, some 
prescriptive requirements on uh, the height of the walls and how much space can be uh, left. I think it's a half inch at the ceiling and uh, an eighth inch uh, opening at the at the uh, door between the door and the frame. So it's fairly prescriptive. And uh, that's it for the for the changes, uh, at least the significant ones in Virginia. Okay. Uh, I've worked on projects in uh, about 30 states, and some states are still using the 20, uh, 2006 and the 2009 IBC. Um, but since DC, Maryland, and uh, Virginia have started uh, their co-development cycles for the 2021 IBC, we thought it would be uh, a good idea to give you a brief preview of what's coming up. In the 2021 IBC, um, we get a lot of questions um, about automatic doors and uh, in the next uh, code development of the 2021 IBC, um, automatic doors will now be required. Uh, they were in some of the standards uh, and they were later removed and now they will be required uh, at all public entrances that are required to be accessible. So if you recall, 60% of public entrances are required to be accessible. Now each will be required to have an automatic door. And, and if there's a vestibule, both the outer, the exterior door and the inner vestibule door will need to be automatic. Uh, we also get a lot of uh, questions concerning uh, EV charging stations. Um, and this again is a new requirement. It'll be in the 2021 standards uh, for 5% of the EV spaces and at least one of each type of EV charger because there's different different ones out there for different um, electric cars um, and they must include a, a van accessible parking space for five percent of the charging locations. Um, the EV stations are similar uh, to fuel dispensing equipment, and that's where they put it in the code. And they did that intentionally so that the spaces uh, won't count toward the accessible parking space requirements. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so the, these are additional um, accessible spaces, but their, their purpose, of course, is only for charging, and uh, they look at charging like fuel dispensing. Uh, note that uh, the controls of the EV stations um, are really already required to be accessible under the operable parts sections of uh, both the Chapter 11 and ANSI. Um, so you should be mindful of your product selections. There are accessible units on the marketplace, but there's a number that are, are not accessible. Uh, Assisted toileting and bathing has been a long conflict between healthcare providers um, and patient safety priorities and accessibility standards that restrict alternative arrangements. The number of accessible water closets in roll in showers in, excess, in assisted living, in uh, rehab facilities, <clears throat> excuse me, in nursing homes can be reduced if the configurations uh, are, are used, uh, these new configurations that are up in the upper left-hand corner of your uh, screen. So in I-1 uses for assisted living and rehab facilities, um, the number of accessible rooms can be reduced by 50%. Um, and replaced with ass assisted bathing dimensions in the bathrooms. Uh, nursing homes 
where it's more likely that the individuals are uh, sicker um, and less mobile, um, the number of accessible rooms can be reduced by 90% and uh, replaced with assisted toilet and bathing facilities. So the dimensions um, th that will appear in the standards are going to be um, different than what we would find in the ANSI standard. For instance, the water closet is shifted 24 to 26 inches uh, to the center line from the sidewall. So it's significantly more than 18. The grab bars uh, wouldn't be reachable uh, if mounted on the walls. So um, this configuration relies on pull-up grab bars which, are, can, which can then fold down so that a caregiver can assist an individual. Um, the next change is uh, another new requirement um, that'll be in 2021 for bottle of, uh, water bottle filling stations. A station over a low wheelchair accessible fountain uh, can be accessible but typically not over the high standing person's fountain, as you see in the photograph there. Um, because the height of the fountain itself exceeds the reach height over an obstruction. Uh, so they are adding an exception um, for this standard as long as a, a, a filling station is provided over the low fountain. The, the, the station on the high fountain um, is not required to be accessible as long as there's one on the low fountain. Uh, and so it, this is somewhat unusual to see both. Generally, uh, clients will delete the bottle filling station on the high fountain because it doesn't meet the accessibility requirements and provide it only at the low fountain. There's a number of manufacturers making uh, separate uh, wall-mounted uh, filling stations that are not um, attached to a, a drinking fountain. And those can certainly be, um, be set at accessible heights as well. So the big change is the reference standard in the 2021 IBC. And that reference standard is uh, adopting the new ANSI A17 standard uh, that's uh, designated as the 2017 version. Um, and this is going to affect all of us. Uh, it will um, require some time to digest. It's a uh, standard uh, that has uh, so many changes that it's really a webinar of its own. Um, but we're just going to give you some highlights this morning. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's a bit of a surprise. Um, as I said, it's a webinar in itself. Um, and so we're just providing a brief overview here. The changes are based on research conducted with persons who use various wheeled, wheeled mobility devices, like motorized wheelchairs and scooters. These changes relate to new construction and not to alteration projects in existing buildings. Uh, the two significant changes uh, are two building block items. They inform much of the rest of the standards. The turning space radius has increased from 60 inches to 67 inches. And the clear floor space has increased from 30 inches wide and 48 inches long to 30 inches wide and 52 inches long. They affect the dimensions of accessible spaces and elements you see listed here. The building blocks inform dimensions of many elements, including accessible route routes, doors and curb ramps, and accessible spaces, including toilet rooms, kitchens, and assembly seat. Here are a few more highlights. There are three new T-shaped turning space options. 
the base width increased from 60 inches to 64 inches. And uh, you see uh, in the center uh, of the sheet existing in new, we're showing an overlay of the original 60 inch turning radius with the 60 by 60 T-shaped turning space. Uh, and then next to it on the right is uh, the new 67 inch turning uh, radius uh, with the three different options for a T-turning space over overlaid on. Um, so uh, while there are options, um, of, uh, the, the, the turning space is, is substantially bigger. Um, that's going to change a lot of standard details um, that you have over the next couple of years, and it's going to take some getting used to. Uh, several states uh, in their current standards have, uh, the current regulations of the states require that uh, they adapt the most recent version of all the reference standards, like the NFPA and so forth. So uh, several states like South Carolina has, uh, who has adapted the 2018 IBC um, already has adapted the standard. And we've um, done some projects using it and uh, it definitely uh, takes some time and there's a bit of a learning curve for our clients. Um, additionally here, uh, the push side front approach uh, door maneuvering clearance is increased from 48 to 52 inches. Uh, curb ramps, the center of the curb ramp was 36 inches wide. It's now 48 inches wide and, and it requires a 48 by 48 inch top landing. The exterior accessible root width increasing, uh, is increasing to 48 inches minimum, uh, but the minimum interior accessible root width is uh, remaining at 36 inches. The turning space size increase and the clear floor space length are informing the length adjustments on uh, the passenger loading zone, uh, access aisle, door maneuvering clearance, shower clearance, and assembly seating. A classification, or rather, I'm sorry, a clarification is uh, provided uh, for U-shaped kitchens in, in this new standard, um, requiring a minimum of a 40 inch dimension between countertops and appliances, um, rather than uh, employing the five feet uh, space in a U-shaped kitchen. So the dimension is less to the island, but it requires that same 40-inch space on all sides of the island. And lastly, small uh, kitchenettes like you would find in some offices with or without a cooktop also require uh, 40 inches minimum clearance. Now we'll continue with uh, recent enforcement activity. And Kate? Um, accessibility enforcement by the Department of Justice and HUD and through private lawsuits is ongoing. Some recent significant cases include the lack of accessible spaces at the newly constructed Queens Public Library. A recent announcement that Amtrak will reimburse travelers for inaccessible sta stations that disrupted their travel. And several multifamily developers and architects are being sued by the fair housing advocacy organizations on behalf of residents. These cases are particularly troubling as the mistakes were repeated in multiple buildings. And finally, the DOJ settled with 19 commercial properties, property owners right here in DC after the DOJ investigated design and construction violations at the 19 properties. Thank you. So we wanted to wrap up with some best practices. 
for uh, mitigating risk during uh, early stages of the design phases. Um, our thoughts are that risk can arise uh, during the design process. And so it's really important that uh, it starts with the entire team agreeing on the importance of accessibility compliance. This is the first big step. It's important to understand what standards and codes apply to the project uh, type and prepare a scoping document that can be a reference throughout the project. Issues arise when a project is defined incorrectly and scoped incorrectly. The accessibility scope may have uh, budget implications as well and should be part of project planning. On renovation projects, don't forget the 20% rule. Both the ADA and the state codes require, require up to 20% of the project cost associated with the primary, uh, the, the alterations to the primary use spaces in the building uh, to be expended on upgrades to uh, the accessible route. Uh, the IBC refers to the accessible route. Uh, the ADA calls it the path of travel. Um, if those upgrades are needed, and it includes restrooms and drinking fountains that serve the areas being altered. Uh, if it's not in the budget, uh, it'll be a surprise. An accessibility survey may be needed to determine what to efficiencies um, are present at the existing building. Uh, Maryland and Arlington and Fairfax counties have uh, accessibility compliance forms um, that, they that are required to demonstrate compliance with the 20% rule. So they're actually looking for, you know, a figure on uh, the cost of the overall project and uh, the deficiencies in in the accessible route and how uh, you plan to spend those funds uh, to bring the accessible route into compliance. Um, a, a checklist is always a good idea and regular meetings to keep the team updated. Uh, internal, peer, internal and peer reviews of design documents are, are recommended um, at, at design milestones E, D, C, D phases. Um, and then uh, we encourage you not to forget accessibility when making design changes and during VE, as well as during submittal and shop drawing reviews. This is often when things get missed. Finally, we recommend scheduling specific accessibility construction reviews on site. Uh, not combined with other inspections and tasks. There's too much going on in the, in the field and too many distractions to try to do too much at once. So we hope this was helpful to you. Thank you very much. And uh, we will send it back to Katie uh, for any questions. Great, thank you both. We do have quite a few questions rolling in. Um, I'm gonna get started with one that was put in through the chat. Um, for all gender restrooms, has WSSC modified requirements for gender specific facilities to accommodate all gender rooms? And what about local and state codes other than Virginia? Uh, not to my knowledge, uh, the acronym you used, I'm not sure who that is. The, uh, can you, if you want to drop in the chat, what you meant by WSSC? And we'll come back to that after he responds. Um, so okay. we have another question. What's the best document for finding the information regarding the accessible medical diagnostic equipment standards? The best location? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. They, are, they are on the U.S. Access Board's web, website. Um, I think it's accessboard.gov. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for EV chargers, uh, do they need to be clear of the parking space and access aisles? Well, yes, and the standard um, doesn't do a good job, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be modified because uh, the parking space and the access aisle are supposed to meet the re requirements uh, for accessible um, you know, spaces and access aisles, uh, and so the, they're supposed to be clear. So installing the unit means you need some space behind the parking space um, and the access aisle, depending on, on the placement. And uh, the uh, access board has a um, uh, sort of a diagram that shows that is is an option. But you know it's very hard to do because most most parking uh, garages you don't have that extra depth. Um, I, I I think we need to propose ultimately is a modification um, that in those spaces the unit could hang in the back of the access aisle. Um, but that's not in the, that new standard, so uh, it would be not until um, the next cycle. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so a question about automatic doors for ADA uh, entrances. In the code, are those doors also required to be on emergency power since power doors can be difficult to open when power is lost? Yes. Uh, Sliding uh, fully automatic doors um, have uh, break uh, out protection and such that is in the uh, um, building manufacturers uh, hardware standards, um, but uh, automatic doors that are uh, uh, like a low power assisted um, would be would generally be connected. Um, the, the standard uh, that I showed you um, doesn't say that, but uh, the ADA has, uh, does not require automatic doors, but if you use them, um, you have to uh, provide uh, backup power. Okay. Now, if you don't have a generator, the facility uh, that could be done with with battery. All right, we have another one coming in through the chat. Um, has there been any progress made on reconciling the discrepancies between the accessibility requirements for multifamily internal mailroom mailboxes between IBC, ANSI, ADA, and the U.S. Postal Service? Yes, there's a memo from HUD. Um, if you don't have it, uh, I can get it to you. You can email me. Uh, and that is the, the final word, uh, which, um, requires the top of the, of the, uh, lock of the highest row of mailboxes to be at 54 inches. And then, uh, Letter boxes, um, I believe it's 28 or 9, I'd have to look, um, because the Postal Service is regulating the low dimension um, for postal workers not to have to bend. And so from that 28 or 29 down to, to 15, it can only be the large parcel boxes in that area. So we, so we took the HUD uh, requirements and uh, the Postal Service requirements and, and put them together. Um, and for multifamily, it is 100% of the mailboxes. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go back to Daniel's question now. So he was referencing all gender restrooms and he was asking if the Washington Sanitary Sewer Commission uh, has modified requirements for gender specific facilities to accommodate all gender rooms. Um, he says currently requirements for uh, gendered rooms do not become lessened if one includes all gender rooms, even if total quantity for fixtures is met. 
Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with their standards. Um, we would only be looking at the plumbing code and, uh, and the building code and the IBC. So um, I'm not familiar with their standards. Okay. Uh, we have one more question. When will the ICC A117 changes become standard in the DMV? Um, they will be with the 2021 uh, adoptions, uh, you know, 2021 IBC adoptions, and they should be um, the end of next year. Um, Maryland's required to um, adopt the, the latest version of, of the IBC within 18 months of it coming out. It's been out um, for over, over six months. Um, so they're less than a year from having to adopt it. And then uh, Maryland municipalities have a year of rollout of it. Um, Virginia has, is on a three-year cycle as well. The, their um, 2018 code was only out, um, I think it's like six months or so. Um, <clears throat> so we have like, you know, two years, two and a half years for for them. And, and DC is is uh, um, kind of a wild card. They hope to um, be back uh, on track with the, with the cycle. So I think you're looking at the end of 23 um, for, uh, the 2017 ANSI to be effect, in effect across across uh, the DMV. Okay, uh, for a multifamily project with multiple separate buildings, can the ANSI Type A units be located in one building, or do they do they need to be distributed throughout all the buildings? Uh, this is in reference to an existing building renovation project where one building is currently accessible and the other would require uh, excuse me require ramps to meet accessibility. And you're you're renovating all of the all of the buildings, assuming um, if they're in. Katie, did you say Type A? Mm -hmm, I did. You broke up a little bit there. Okay. Um, and uh, she says yes, renovating all buildings. Yeah. So you're 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 required uh, to disperse them um, amongst the among the units that are getting off. So if you are altering all of the buildings, uh, then you would have to redistribute them. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so we have one more question. This might be a tough one to do in six minutes, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, can you sum up DC's application of the ADA to historic structures and to existing structures other than historic? Katie, say it again, please. Sure. Uh, please sum up DC's application of the ADA to historic structures and to existing structures other than a historic. Well, when you say the application of the ADA, so um, the ADA is separate, again, because it's a federal standard. Um, the ADA uh, and the DC building code um, have uh, historic structures still have to be made accessible, but there's uh, uh, some additional allowances, um, such as one entrance for um, historic buildings. Uh, other reductions uh, of accessibility in historic buildings um, have, have to be approved by the historic preservation officer um, and uh, they would have to agree that you can't make the particular item accessible um, in that it would destroy the historic character of the building. So uh, that's uh, sometimes um, a heavy lift to be able to prove that. Uh, so, uh, you know, typically um, we try to solve the accessibility issue um, 
in the building itself without doing that. Um, alterations to non-historic buildings, uh, you have to file the IEBC, the existing building code. And uh, we didn't have enough time today to, to look at all of those requirements. Um, chapter for DC, it's still chapter seven. Uh, for Maryland and Virginia, it's chapter three. Uh, they just move things around. Um, and uh, if you look at 705 um, in the IEBC, um, there are two main requirements, 705, one and, and two, um, say that um, anything you're altering has to be fully accessible and meet the requirements of chapter 11 uh, for new construction with like 15 exceptions that are listed there. There's some reduction uh, in, you know, entrances and restrooms and so forth. They're spelled out there. The second requirement is what we talked about earlier, the path of travel requirement, and that's making sure that um, all of your altered areas have an accessible route to them and all of the restrooms, whether or not they were in your scope. Um, you may be renovating, you know, part of a floor and uh, down the corridor near the elevators are the restrooms and they weren't in your project scope. If they serve that area being altered, then they have to be um, brought up to uh, code as well uh, to be accessible. So that 7051 and 7052 really give the main the main scope, as well as the introduction to uh, that section of the code, which uh, the IEBC, which explains that the intent is uh, full accessibility to the greatest extent possible. <clears throat> All right, perfect. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your expertise. Um, I already have a lot of folks asking me if they can get in contact with you and maybe see some of your slides at a later date. Uh, so everyone, thank you for coming today. And we will see everyone at our next session on the DOEE -E Innovation Grant at 11.30.